Okay, so how do you take a scene of, uh, you know, typical scenic stamping elements and change it from, you know, a spirit of like this type of thing in spring to kind of more of this Halloween spirited type of scene? You can change your color scheme around, you know, from, you know, the absence of color to a monochromatic. I mean, you can do all kinds of other colors too. I just happen to do it all in black versifying to test how that could be used to apply inks and to, you know, totally um, tone in a scene and define its values and lights and darks and things like that. But you can also just change the spirit of a scene like this depending on what you use as a focal point. Now the focal point in this one is really about that mill there and the star of the scene is probably all those pink, all that pink foliage around here, but something like this, you know, I think that watermill becomes a little bit more secondary when you stamp something like the skeleton dancing in the water down there. I think that tends to be, you know, or would be the, the landing spot of someone's eye and uh, the, thus become the focal point of the scene. Plus I have all these beams of light and things like that and the uh, spotlit illumination type of uh, technique used in this scene right here. But, you know, just change uh, things around. I was, as I mentioned in the video, if I had a scene like this, and if I stamped it just all in blue tones or something like that, it would probably, and you know, I splatter painted it with something like this to give it a snowy kind of patterning and texture to it, like first snow of the year or whatever. I don't know. I think it would look like a winter scene and whatnot. So there's all kinds of different things you can do with scenic stamping elements, and you can cater them towards any type of feel, emotion, quality, time of day, time of year, season that you want just by changing your media around it. So there's not just one way to use a scenic stamping stamp uh, by any means. Okay, but anyways, if you choose to watch the video, hope you enjoy it. This is done on the Staples 110 pound cardstock. It's an uncoated cardstock and uh, it worked just fine for me. And this was um, this composition that I started off here, as I mentioned in the video, was just kind of a leftover piece from a previous video, so I didn't put it to waste or, you know, made it to, uh, made good use out of it in this uh, scene. Okay, so anyways, hope you enjoy it. Okay, um, we've done a scene recently using charcoal for uh, the watermill and uh, babbling brook stamps. And this was one uh, scene that I started stamping. I didn't really stamp. I need to use a little bit more pressure, so I put a lot more um, copy paper underneath my, my desk here, but that should really do it. But um, anyways, when I was recording my first video or, uh, with that um, composition in mind, uh, just something happened to my camera. It just shut off, and you know, and then I I had to start over again. So um, I have this piece right here, and I only got two images into the uh, the composition. This is on the Staples 110 pound um, clard stock here. It's an uncoated paper, just off the shelf. You know, I bought a ream of it at Staples. But that being said, I I don't like to waste paper. So even something like this, I just feel. You know, I feel like finishing it off and seeing what I can do with it. Someone mentioned that they're doing Halloween cards um, uh, in their, I don't know, their current uh, process, um, you know, list of uh, to-dos. And I thought I would do something Halloween-ish, you know, Halloween-spirited out of this piece right here. Okay, now this was a scene that I did on a satin, kind of a dull finish paper. And of course it's done, you know, done in a kind of a spring type of um, color scheme here with the, the pinks and, uh, you know, the bright blues and kind of a, you know, a real, I don't know, spring-like uh, type of color scheme here, time of year, whatever. But let's do something like this, but let's make it more, you know, fall and Halloween. Now, how do you do something like that with this? Well, nature, natural elements, scenic stamping, they're the most versatile stamps out there. They're not specific to any time of year or look, okay? Well, maybe if you have a snow image, you know, snow on trees or something like that, then it would be winter, of course. But um, with anything else... You, all you have to do is just change the color, and you really change the emotional tone of the piece, okay? 
I mean, I could do something like this. This could be in spring, and it could be, you know, spring at sunset or something like that instead of high noon as well. But if we take a composition like this, and um, I'm not going to use the exact same images on this one uh, as this, but it's kind of the same, you know, it's the same, you know, foundational kind of compositional element in a waterfall and the watermill, okay? But I'm going to change this one to monochromatic and grayscale, okay? That immediately gives it a certain type of feel. I don't necessarily think it looks spooky or anything like that. It's just like, you know, if you look at black and white photography, it doesn't make everything look spooky or anything like that. You know, an Ansel Adams uh, photograph of, you know, uh, Yosemite, I don't look at those and say, oh my gosh, that's Halloween or something like that. But just little things like this, you know, instead of a... Uh, uh, you know, the oak branch around here on the perimeter, you could make it a little bit more Halloween looking with something like the spooky branch here in the foreground, okay? Now let's say I was going to use some wildlife in this one. Let's say there was a couple um, swimming ducks in the water down here. Well, instead of, cha you know, having a couple little ducks like this, or if I had birds flying in the sky up there, you can change it to bats. And uh, I thought in this one I would use my Gumbo Graphics, um, they're a company that's no longer around, but you see this dancing skeleton and various um, uh, catalogs still out there and available, places like Viva Las Vegas probably has it, or I'm not sure if 100 Proof Press has it, but um, anyways, you know, instead of ducks down here, I'm going to put this little dancing skeleton. I thought it would kind of look interesting if he's like, a, like taking a shower in this pool down here, okay? So Halloween, I mean, it could you, you can make it look as ominous as you want, but you can also have kind of a humorous element with your, you know, skeletal uh, features in here, if it was going to be something like that or, or whatever, you know? And I thought I would try something a little bit different with my um, elements within this scene. I thought, I, or my, my, my toning um, process, okay? I'm going to change around with my elements as well, but um, I thought I would try to color this using my black pigment ink. I'm usually just stamping images in VersaFine Black, but I thought we would try to just tone in the whole thing, okay? And I have a feeling it's going to be something like using, um, if it's something like the, um, the hybrid inks out there, um, the oil-based hybrid inks, this is an oil-based uh, pigment ink right here, I have a feeling it'll probably feel like something similar. The only thing about it is this Versafine Black is so dark, you know, I, I'm going to have to see if I have um, enough kind of touch, you know, with my, uh, you know, my process here that I'll be able to get a good um, application of media, you know, to tone this piece in to the degree that I want it toned in, okay? I want to be able to control my um, grayscale uh, values in addition to getting achieving some kind of real darker tones, okay? So you're gonna, we're going to use black for everything from like 5% gray all the way to, uh, you know, 100% black if we can. Okay, so let's go with the composition here. I'm going to add in these clouds right here. This is the cloud chemist. I thought I would have some, like a break in the clouds and uh, having this beam of light coming down here on our subject matter. Okay, now I thought I took off a little bit more ink <laughs> off this cloud than I actually did. Um, I don't know, it's tricky using um, an ink that's just so dark, which VersaFine is, and that's why I like using it, but let's try to control the amount of ink in the impressions using it, okay? So I'm going to try to control the amount of ink that's applied, but also in my impressions right here. Okay, so I didn't even mask off that mill there, but we'll just say that's a, that's a shadow on top of the roof, you know, creating a little bit of variation. All right, now I'm wiping off the entire perimeter of this cloud, okay, so I can get a lighter impression like that. See how this one's darker? This one's just a little bit of it, and I'll put another one right here, so we'll have this, like, illuminated break in the clouds out this way. In theory, I don't need to, you know, ink up this whole cloud because I'm only going to use a certain portion of it, but, you know, I'm not going to take my time to, you know, just get it exactly where I want it to go. 
um, you know, wasting a little bit of ink like that. It's not going to be a big deal. Okay, so let's go with this one right here. I'm doing, I stamped this one like this. This one I went, I mean, you're not supposed to go completely 90 degrees like that. I would go more of like a, I don't know, like a 45 degree or something like that. But you you can go pretty extreme with this cloud right here. Okay, see that? All right, now maybe I'll make a slightly darker impression. Maybe I'll take off a little bit less. Wipe off. I'm wiping off a good, I don't know, inch into this design. And I'm wiping off some of this darkest portion of it right here. But I want to go slightly darker if I can. I don't know if I took off too much. <clears throat> There's plenty of leeway, you know. It's not like, oh my gosh, I took off, you know, half inch too much. That's, you know, I've ruined it or anything like that. It's not going to be a big deal. But see, there's my break in the clouds, and that well, that's where I'll have some light coming out of there. I can make that little space in there a little bit tighter. Maybe I'll come up with another impression here. I won't even re-ink it. Yeah, see, like that. So I created this really small one. So I'll show you how these impressions went, okay? The light is coming from this way, okay? So if I have it like this, it's being bottom lit. If I have it like this, it's being top lit, where I'm kind of you know, circling this little area right here and retaining this open area. I stamped it like that. One, two, three, four, five impressions, okay? But this little cloud right here, well, it's not that small. It's about two by three. See, it fills in this whole space right there. Uh, you know, this large section up here. Now, I have this area out here. Why don't we go for a darker impression? What I do is, if this is going to be the light source here, so notice how it's getting darker as it moves away from the light source, okay? All right, now this one, I, I mean, this one's going to be all in darkness, so I don't really need to wipe off the stamp. I'm just going to go with a straight impression. But do you get that as far as the, uh, the concept goes? Darker impressions out here because it's f uh, farther away from the light source. This one's a little bit lighter, so I wiped off this part so it'd stamp out from a little bit wetter to dry. And then, where this is kind of encircling the light area, you know, it was the second impression plus wiping off, okay? So anytime, if the light is going to be right in here, then you want to remove that area of all that, where it's all inked up, all right? Now this is just, you know, this is kind of an extreme version of it because I'm going for this black and white type of scene. You can use this in a light blue and it's going to look like high noon in spring or something like that, you know. So different personalities for the stamps depending on the time of year or time of day, season, whatever that you want to depict. All right, so let's add in some additional, I'll just use this tree cluster stamp here to fill in some additional trees around this. Notice I'm not doing any type of masking um, here. I mean, you certainly could mask if you want to, but it's not necessarily needed. Um, you can go with some more trees down this way. I'm going to go for um, some additional rock forms, though. Okay. Um, I'll grab my boulders with lichen. That's something that I've used fairly recently. Using all my um, versifying inks <laughs> lately on a lot of my stamps here, I really should take this with a kind of a diluted dishwashing detergent and really clean off my stamps really well. I don't know if I really have to, but this VersaFine, when it dries onto the uh, stamp right here, because it's an oil-based media, and then if I try to take like a water-based dye ink and then ink it up on there and use that next time, that water, you know, that oil-based uh, pigment ink might resist it a little bit. So, um, you know, it might be a good idea to really uh, give uh, the stamps a good cleansing. You know, since I'm not doing it, you know during the process of, uh, you know, oftentimes stamping my scenes that are doing these videos in particular. Okay, so see that right there? I've, you know, used this right here. I've used it to fill in the sides around that waterfall. I could have used this side right here, the waterfall, and stamped it over here and this side of the waterfall to stamp over here too, so you can 
use this one waterfall to fill in the side areas as well. Okay, so let's see. The thing that I'm kind of curious about is if I should stamp this skeleton right now or if I should tone in my, my piece first. I think I feel inclined to... So if I stamp, if I do a lot of things before I stamp this skeleton in here, like I want to put some mist over here, so if I put some white pigment ink on here, if this is already stamped out, the white pigment ink is going to go in front, you know, right over the top of his arms and things like that. Or I might want to lay that, that down first, and then I'll take this and ink it and stamp it right over that so, you know, the skeleton looks like more, it's like in front of that mist down there. Okay, so that's being said. Let's stamp that later, and let's get to toning the scene. Okay, light source reflected light down here, okay? So this is kind of like what, what I call spotlighting. You're leaving an area spotlit for kind of a, a subject matter of your scene, kind of the star of the scene. Doesn't have to be something as, you know, real obvious as this, you know, this dancing skeleton. You could spotlight, a, you know, some birds or something like that or whatever you want, you know, in your sky. Just It's just, it's it's staging. Okay, I'm just using the same, why not use the same paper towel that I wiped off around here because, you know, we already have some of that ink on here, so why not use that? All right. All right, so I'm inking up a little bit more. I haven't done this before with this um, Versafine, so let's see how dark it is. Well, let me just test it on here. Okay, that's not too bad. That's like a, see, I inked that up pretty good. But see, this is, See how soft that is right there? So just don't be heavy-handed. Just don't go like that, you know? And then you're going to be fine. I'm just, I'm not being super gingerly with this or anything. Or wipe it off first, you know, and get a good kind of a application amount going. And yeah, okay, this is working out great. See, that's what I wanted. I wanted a lot of control over it. And that's, you know, that's a real light shade. So I can go like this. You know, and it's and it's really light, okay? Okay, so I see I take it, I start it off the page like that. See where I'm doing that? And then I'm working on like that. I think I like this better than working with my charcoals, just, I don't know, my real gut initial um, feeling about this. I, bet I used those dry charcoals in a, a previous video on this scene, on this composition right here, but um, I think there's a little bit more control over this uh, right here. Of course, there is something to be said for charcoals and that kind of art supply media out there. This is good for kind of general areas of uh, toning. I don't know how good it's going to be for, say, detailed areas, so we'll see if we can kind of devise um, a system for getting um, in a little bit more of a kind of a select area of ink, okay? Uh, the last time, last video I just uh, did, I used uh, kind of a Q-tip just, you know, within you know the, the paper towel here. Okay, so um, let's take a look at this light source right here. If this is our light source, should we go like this? You know, absolutely not. But it doesn't mean that we can't touch anything around here. See, if I want that area to stand out and look lighter, you kind of have to take the area around it and make it darker. But we don't have to use 100% black. You can use, you know, 5% gray. You see that right there? See, I'm kind of oscillating it, too. What I'll do in here is I'll go light, dark, light, dark, light. And that just, it varies it a little bit more. It's called checkerboarding. It's checkerboarding of value. It's really easy to do with them um, when you're doing monochromatics, too, because you're not really thinking about, you're not having to think about hue, temperature, intensity, um, things like that. 
you're just looking for light and dark basically and uh, I think when you if you want to develop your um, lighting techniques composition and things like that um, it's a good idea to do these monochromatics every now and then because it it sensitizes you is that the word to lighting more than working in color and then when you go back to color you can bring those sensibilities and can heighten sensibilities to your color work okay but see this right here it's like I'm just concentrating on value um, we can see that light kind of illuminating this area down here I might actually use um, kind of a light beam I'm not sure maybe <laughs> kind of make it look a little bit more majestic it's kind of a kind of humorous you know to having this uh, you know thinking about this majestic skeleton you know in the water but uh, I don't know it's kind of fun we'll call it like bathing in the moonlight or something like that okay now what I like to do is I like to vary my um, values right I don't want it just all super light I, I do want it to go from uh, I do want to have some darker tones in here but what I like to do is I'd like to bring those darker tones around on the perimeter like this Okay, so the darker I make this area out here, look at that, the lighter it seems by contrast over there. I might put a little bit right up here in the corner. Okay, I can deepen some of my shadows. You don't have to deepen them equally. You can have, you know, different values of shadows like that. But look at that. Doesn't that look pretty rich up there in terms of the lighting? And it was really easy to do. You're just using one color. Now, if you want to, you can also use something like gray if you have it. I don't have um, a pigment ink gray, though. Let's see this right here. I'm bringing some of this into my um, rocks down here. Let me see. I'll kind of just bend this so it's going a little bit more flat, but then I'll just bend it like that and make it a more narrow applicator see this area on this rock where it's dark right well I can go in there and just make it a little bit darker like that see what like that that does, does isn't there a, kind of an added visual weight when you anchor your imagery into the scene a little bit more with shadow and shading it gives the it gives the uh, imagery that visual weight and uh, I don't know it just it it creates more uh, volumes within the space okay within that area okay. now I don't know exactly when I start this out I don't know exactly where I'm going with lighting everywhere in the scene. I know this was going to be light up here. This is going to be light down here. I don't know exactly to what extent I'm going to take my shading. What I'm doing is just, you have to kind of look at your scene. One of the best things to do is just hold your scene at kind of arm's distance, okay? Don't always work like in specifics like this. This is kind of an example of what I'm looking at when I'm working on it. But then what I do is I hold it out at arm's distance to get a feel of what I'm doing and how it's affecting kind of the overall, okay? It's easy to get really caught up in kind of the details and whatnot, which is good, but also have kind of, you know, um, an even greater kind of understanding or take on your overall, okay? So like this, I'm just kind of developing my rock like that, but I'm looking at it now in the context of a whole piece and seeing how it looks. Okay, adding a little tone here and there. Let's make this area over here along the water mill a little bit darker, okay? Darkening this area right here, not necessarily, look, you know, black, but just darker than it was. 
So like this. I think it's bringing a little bit more focus into this area right here by darkening this area in here. I don't want to darken everything because I, I want my watermill to show, of course, but those are the types of things I'm looking for here. <clears throat> okay. Now, in certain areas, I want to kind of subdue the information in them because, you know, I want more of the focus to be in here. So around on the perimeter here, too, what I do, it's, it's just like doing a vignette, okay? It's nothing different than what, you know, everyone's, you know, like studio portraits look like. You know, there's a vignette typically around the individual just so it focuses the intention on the subject matter being, you know, whoever's posing for that uh, photograph, right? So you darken it in, and it contains the composition, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm just making the perimeter a little bit darker, okay? But you don't make it like darker like this, okay? Where it's like this right here, so it's like dark and then just light. You want it, you know, you want to bring it in like this, okay? So it's darker out here, and it, it fades in. It transitions in to the light, okay? See like that? Okay, this is coming along. I like to leave my waterfalls nice and light. I think it's uh, a good look, but let's put a little bit of tone on them, just a tiny bit, so it's not so stark white. See that little tiny bit? Then I can come in here with some additional kind of white highlights and have it kind of illuminate sparkle. Okay, let's take this area back here and just tone it down a touch so that, you know, stronger focus on that light source opening point. Okay, the rock right here, it can be kind of a toned a little bit more to make it look a little bit more three-dimensional and have that visual weight. Okay, almost there. This area down here is a little bit too light, I think, though. See, I'm kind of closing off this um, corner here like that. Since there was nothing there, so that closes us off um, in a compositional sense. All right, now I don't like this real harsh line there, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to subdue that contrast of that line by just making this cloud out here a little bit darker. Okay? So it doesn't look quite so harsh. Okay, a little bit of stronger vignette out here. Now I can't do this if it was on um, a glossy cardstock because this oil-based pigment ink isn't going to uh, dry on me very well. I don't know, maybe applying it this way, maybe I'm not applying so much. Look at this, I'm getting real uh, fingerprints everywhere. It gets kind of smudgy like this, even touching this. So even on this paper, that's going to be a lot more absorbent than, say, a glossy cardstock, which I wouldn't use, you know, like I said, but uh, it, um, it doesn't dry very fast. That's what's making it so easy for me to kind of spread it around, though. But you have to kind of, uh, you know, keep, you know, be mindful of that um, 
of that uh, characteristic of the media that you're working with. So slower drawing, you know, smudgier potential areas. Just be careful about that. Okay, so I think we have most of this established here. I think that looks pretty good as far as um, the tone that we'll need. I don't like how light that tree is over there. Let's put a little bit of tone on that. Let's tone in some of this um, areas. Right? Let's not tone in some of the areas around here. I don't want them so stark and you know, light like that. I think it's I well, really want that strong attention down here. Okay, so I think this piece of paper has had it. I think I'm picking up a lot of ink just handling everything like that. Here's what I have to do when I'm doing something like this too, or charcoals or something like that. I need to be mindful, and I think I need to wash my fingers, you know, so that when I'm handling this, it won't uh, kind of spread everywhere. And also, now I think it might be time to apply some spray sealant on this just to uh, seal in all of this um, color application, toning application with the Versafine. But I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to stamp here first before I spray it off. Is, is there anything that won't adhere to the surface or maybe will adhere better if I don't spray it first, okay? Well, one of the things I'm wondering about is the uh, the white pigment ink. I think on the last one I spray sealed it in the workable fixative, I was able to apply the, uh, the white right over the top of it, so maybe that won't be a problem. But I still do have this foreground imagery, and that's stamped over the top of the sealant as well, so we're off to seal, and what I will be sealing this um, initial toning with is the workable fixative from Krylon. There's various brands out there. I think there's some art sprays. I mean, this is an art spray too, but there's like other brands as well. If they still exist, I used one of them for like 20 years and tossed the can recently. But the workable fixatives are going to have um, a matte finish to them. Okay, they're not going to be glossy like a like a Krylon, you know crystal clear, or UV resistant clear, that type of thing, polyurethane. Okay, so anyways, let's seal this off and we'll get back in. Uh, back. Okay, we're back and uh, just a couple quick sprays. The workable fixative really dries fast. Um, I don't know if it goes on lighter or something like that, but it seems like it just dries much faster than a, than a glossy spray. This one too, it doesn't seem to have that real strong odor so <laughs> of uh, the other Krylons and whatnot, so um, should be dry enough. One thing I noticed, I think when I sprayed this, I believe the saturation and uh, value got darker um, when sprayed, so in, in this case I think that's a good thing. Um, when I spray it after after I apply some of this, I don't you know if it gets darker. I don't know if that's going to be a good thing or not. But um, okay, so um, let's apply some of this Hero Arts. The the the, the spray fixative. Uh, I think it's more of an integral process um, when doing these certain types of media and matte cardstock applications. Okay, I need to seal in layers of media, you know, depending on what I'm uh, applying on here. Okay, so that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with some white pigment ink. I get the Hero Arts one. You know, if I had the Moonlight Duo ones, the white pigment inks in these ones, uh, color box, whatever. You know, you don't have to, it's not specific to Hero Arts. I just, what I heard from uh, a bunch of stampers that they, they think the, the Hero Arts one is just, it's lighter, it's whiter, okay? So, you know, when you get a black one, you want, you know, it to be blacker. When you get the white one, you want it to be whiter, right? So I picked it up, and I think it works pretty good, but it's not like, you know, a huge amount, oh my god, that's so much whiter, um, that I can tell in the way that I use it, okay? But if it's whiter, I want to use it.
you know, provided I needed a new pad anyway, which I did. I was using like 20 year old uh, color box uh, frost white uh, pigment ink pads. Okay, so I'm adding this around my light areas, and where this really looks really good is where light meets dark, okay? So I start adding it in the lighter areas, okay? And then I transition it a little bit into the darker areas, okay? So dark goes to transitions to light, and light transitions to dark, okay? So you use more of black ink away from the light, and then you use less of it as you get closer to the light. And with white, it's the opposite. You start using it more in the light, and then you use less of it, you know, as it transitions away into the darkness, okay? Does that make sense? That's with anything. I mean, I could be doing um, little white paint pen embellishments, and it would be the same type of thing. I would use more dots closer to the light, and I'd use less of them, less of them, as it moves away from that light. Okay, but see this right down here? See this right around the uh, the base of the waterfalls, around some of these rocks? Look at that mist, you know, from that churning water. Doesn't that look kind of more dimensional and rich down there? It looks like it's glowing, I think. But remember, it's not just some blobby application of this. I'm using it more in the light, and then I'm transitioning it up here. It's not precarious or anything like that. Like, I can go like this, you know what I mean? And you can't see anything, but you have to kind of just concentrate it in an area, okay, for it to show. And then as I'm moving out like this, I'm just using a little bit less. I'm not having to use like a lot of touch, you know, when I have not too much ink on this applicator, which is a cotton ball, okay. So just take it down there, apply it in the lighter areas, and then just transition it out. Use a little bit less as you move away from it. I, I want this one to be pretty misty looking and magical. I think it'll, um, I don't know, kind of add to the spirit of the scene. You know, just the overall feel of it. Remember how I left the uh, the falling water light, so that's getting some additional illumination, like that. See, I think that looks really fun. It just looks like so, I don't know, what's the word? Um, uh, tranquil, I don't know, something like that. It's, when you when you when you get that kind of mist or something kind of suspended between objects, you know, like some fog or whatever, you know, it, there's a different feel to it. You know, if it's a light fog or something like that, you know, where it's being illuminated, the reason why fog and look, I I think looks like, you know has a certain type of emotional quality to it is because it's light. You can't see fog unless there's some light hitting it. So and it the way that it hits it, it's almost like this. It's this really, it makes everything soft, you know, from a visual standpoint. It's because you get all that um, moisture in there and it's being, it's very reflective and it illuminates um, things. So it's like putting, you know, it's like putting kind of natural lighting into a location and it's the softest lighting possible uh, that you can get. So there's a softness to it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put this mill in a big bank of fog, I think. But I don't want it everywhere. I want it to I want to oscillate it, you know, like right here. And then I'll you know, have nothing right here, but then I'll I can put some more over this way. It's just kind of a I mean I know there wasn't light over here, but in something like this, you can really add it wherever you want to. Just, just taper it off, you know, so it's kind of soft like that. Again, it's not like this blobby um, kind of application of it. Okay, I'll put 
these uh, trees back here in a little bit more fog. Now, when I spray this, I'm going to, you know, try to be mindful of um, this white pigment ink and not lose all my uh, applications of it. But it will get more transparent, and thus, you know, it'll look darker where I've applied it. Hopefully I won't spray it all out, you know, where I've lost it all, but... Um, you know, I need to be very mindful of it when spraying. So, in other words, what I'm going to do is I'm trying to give it a much lighter coat of a spray. Alright, so down here we can apply some in this uh, around the waterfalls as well, like I said, around some of these rocks. When you do this, you kind of vary the um, the impression, the visual impression of the rock too, so you get a soft and crisp impression of that object, so that object itself becomes a much richer visual statement as well. You know, the whole image doesn't all have to be, you know, completely sharp. That's what we want our, out of our, you know, impressions. We don't want it to stamp light, uh, softer, but, uh, but you can apply it in very strategic areas. Like, okay, so what I'm talking about right here, see that tree was black, right? Just as this whole thing was. That tree is a part of this image right here, um, the watermill. But see, I applied some of that white pigment ink up here, so now it looks, you know, like a more three-dimensional tree, and it varies it from this, from the watermill itself. It's a little bit more just varied in value. There's light values of black, which is gray, and the darker values of uh, that ink, uh, which are black. And it isn't just the straight uh, color of the ink, which is, I stamped all this imagery out in Versifying, um, you know, including the mill and babbling brook. Okay, so let's put some light beams into the scene here. Okay. I want most of the beam to be coming down to this um, area down here with the uh, where the skeleton will be. Okay, so I'll show you how to do this if you haven't seen any of my videos before. Now, let's see. Let me take... This is a silver pen right here. I just need something to put a little dot down here, but I'll put a little dot there. Okay, it's very subtle, okay? So I put a little dot there. Uh, I, I can see it. And that's going to be my kind of emanation point for my light beams that I add in here. These light beams are really easy. They're really fun to do. Um, but just keep in mind, I think it looks... A little bit more interesting and maybe more realistic if you kind of vary them again. I keep saying that word, but you know that's what uh, variety you know is. Um, it adds to potential um, visual richness. You know, just you know the opposite of variety would kind of be monotony, right? And I mean, monotony could be pattern, too, you know, which isn't bad, but uh, I just think in kind of a natural setting like this, a scene, I think variety looks really good. Okay, so there's that beam across there. Uh, can you see that? Going that way. It'll be much more apparent when I add these other ones in here. So that one could be going, I mean, it could be really close to us, but it could be in back of the mill, but if I put one right over the front of this mill, it'll sandwich that mill in between light, okay? And that's really fun to do. Okay. I like to vary the size of my beams. And I, I can't see my little dot. Okay. I think it's somewhere like there. Okay, let's see. I was going to do something in that window of the mill, so maybe I'll kind of avoid going over that part of the mill. Let 
Okay, maybe I'll make this beam a little bit wider. Oh, sorry. Like that. You add more ink close to the beam, right? It's lighter over there because that's the source of light. And as you run it across here, just use less. So you're tapering it more to less. It's light to dark, okay? Or darker. And sometimes I vary the beam, too. I, I have more on the top of the beam than on the bottom of the beam, or something like that. So not only does um, kind of something not have to be perfect, I think it looks even better. It looks more natural. Okay, see that beam kind of going across there? Is it looking kind of a little bit more majestic? I mean, you can see this where I'm going. I'm going to have this kind of shiny down on this little skeleton down here. So he's going to be having a really great time, I think. Uh, it just looks like a very majestic outdoor. Um, whatever, bathing moment, I guess. Okay. And what I like to do, going back to that, I can't see my little dot there. I think it's right there. <laughs> it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Uh, let's make a real narrow beam. Like Let's go like this. Okay. It's real thin. So again, that variation, right? A lot more up here. I like to use natural cotton, 100% natural cotton. I don't find the acrylic works very well. It's real textured and it doesn't it doesn't um, absorb and then transfer the ink as easily as like a natural fiber. And it's it's pretty pronounced. It does it doesn't it makes a pretty big difference I find. And I don't use one thing. This this one little cotton ball lasts me a while too. Um, I can use it. I like using it over and over for several scenes. So see that beam going down that way. Let's put another big spotlight on our character, which will be right here. Okay, let's go like this. Always go from that same focal point. Okay, it makes it more uniform and uh, targeted unless you have multiple light sources or something like that okay now this is a really quite a wide beam so I don't think I'm going to go too opaque with it you know I'll leave it kind of lighter And I'll kind of have it ending here. I won't go all the way, all the way down into this darkness right here. I want it to look like it's landing in the water where that skeleton is. Okay. See that right there? How that beam's kind of coming down, and it'll be right here in the water. This is just one of those little compositional things. Um, I don't know. If there's four beams like that, I'd like to put kind of an odd number of them in there. I say that um, kind of uh, compositions, uh, things in odd numbers, are they look a little bit more kind of harmonious than an even number uh, for some reason. You don't have to put everything in odd numbers. It's just that, you know, if there's a ver something very prominent in there. Okay, so right there. Remember, it's cool. that one looks pretty light like that, but even these ones over here, they look like they're getting 
um, a little bit lighter as they dry here. So they dry lighter. Now watch this right here. I'm going to, that being said, you can kind of watch it. I'm going to kind of curtain, I call this curtaining this um, beam right here. I'll just go much lighter on the top side of it here. So it goes from something fairly light <clears throat> on the top of it, and then it just kind of transitions a little bit lighter, or darker on the bottom of it, because it's a little bit more transparent and thinner of an application of uh, the pigment ink. Okay, so see that. See how that one right there is a little bit lighter on top and darker on the bottom, like that. Well, you can barely see that. Uh, water mill. You see it like that, but then as you move away from that, doesn't it really push back that mill uh, back in the distance? Now, I'm going to put another beam <clears throat> back here, but let's have it go behind these trees. So, it'll be a very, you know, um, subtle beam. Okay. i got to keep track of where those where those trees are right there. Yeah, I don't know if it went. I put a little bit of it in front of that tree too, but uh, I think it looks okay. How about one back here? Keep it kind of subtle. Eh, something like that. <clears throat> okay, so. A little bit more dynamic of a, of a scene when you add those beams like that. Those beams are really fun to do. I, when I first started doing them, I, you know, I had to kind of make a conscious effort to not do that, or a decision to not keep doing that like on every single scene. I mean, it could add quite a bit to a scene um, when you do that. Okay, now after you get that added in to here, I almost forgot to do this, is sometimes what I do is I kind of incorporate those beams a little bit more into the scene so I can add a little bit more, or a lot more, white pigment ink into the piece and over some of those beams just to kind of mellow them out a little bit and incorporate them in with the surrounding. They don't have to be like so prominent. You can kind of add more white around it so it kind of diffuses it a little bit. Okay, I really want this area down here to really uh, kick up some of that um, churning water mist. This area over here really became very dark where I had that pigment ink. This pigment ink, like I said, it really dries um, much more transparent than what it looks like when it's been applied wet. So it's a little bit hard to tell how far to take it. Sometimes I think, oh my gosh, I, I put too much, you know. And then just, uh, you know, by the time it dries, it's, you know, it's nothing like... Um, you know what it looked like before in terms of the contrast um, that it that it looks like when it's wet okay so anyways you see that um, light source and reflected light okay spotlit area down here okay so let's get on with um, um, I was thinking I, I could spray seal it now. Okay, and then I think I'm going to go on to it with some bleed proof white. <laughs> Luckily, this spray seal just dries so fast, and I can get to work on it right away. I don't need to let it set up and dry, so um, easy stuff to use. All right, another spraying. Um, I don't know if you can tell, you know, maybe with this, uh, kind of this uh,
pausing the video and just immediately starting right up. Maybe you can tell the difference in terms of the, uh, the contrast of those beams. Sometimes you spray it and then you kind of expedite that, um, you know, that translucency effect, transparency, translucent, uh, opaque to trans translucent means you can see through it a little bit and transparent means you can completely see through it. But um, sometimes you kind of expedite that process. I have a feeling when we spray this right here, that's what it's going to look like now. Um, if you don't spray it some more, and I think uh, you can get a better idea of how it's going to look. I mean, we could go back, let's say some of these beams became really transparent and you wanted them to be stronger. I mean, you could just go back over it again and add more ink to it, you know, and vary the beams. Maybe they'd look a little bit more kind of advanced and uh, rich by having a, you know, a stronger look to it here, you know, closer to the light and lighter down here. I don't know. I'm not going to really bother doing that again because I don't want to go with, you know, I don't want to put you know, like 10 sprays on here. Not that it takes long or anything like that, but um, uh, I think we're ready for um, some other imagery. Do I do the imagery first? Do I do the bleed proof white? I think we got to do the bleed proof white last because I'm not going to be able to stamp these images right over the top of bleed proof white because bleed proof white is like a these little dome of a, uh, paint wherever you splatter paint it or you know paint with it on there so I, I think we're ready for some additional imagery let's go with um, the spooky branch for some foreground kind of ominous looking you know types of uh, textures patterns whatever shapes shapes okay The spooky branch really works great for um, spring types of uh, scenes too because you stamp this out and if it's like a cherry blossom or something like that and then you put little pink little um, paint pen dots you know all over the branches and it looks like a cherry blossom so the kind of this bare branch aspect of things works out really good for many different usages. Okay so you know, I was talking about this composition earlier um, you know something like this if we wanted to make this winter or something like that. I don't know if I would use those same trees in there, but um, if you stamp this and you finished everything off in blue tones, it tends to look like a cool kind of wintry looking night, okay? You know, going back to that, um, what I was mentioning about um, how versatile um, scenic stamping imagery is. You just change the, uh, the colors of things. Look how nicely that stamps out right over the top of the uh, the spray fixative. Okay, let's go a little bit right here. You know, having something dark in a scene next to something light makes the light seem even lighter, even if it's just this one little branch right here. See how that branch contrasts against this cloud and the opening. So what we get here is sharp on soft, but you also get um, dark on light. So the dark makes the light seem lighter and the crisp makes the soft seem softer and vice versa. Okay, so you play contrasts against one another like that. It's just easy little concepts to do. You know, I, you know, I just think it, it adds depth too, okay? But that's all these little things add up to kind of that greater whole. something like this. I'll use a pretty big portion of this. I always think more than I think I'm going to need because as I, you know, kind of decide on where I want to put this, and there's various places you can put it. One way is not better than another. I might, you know, if I did this scene, you know, f four different times, I would probably stamp it out in four different ways. Okay, so there's that branch right there. It's kind of dark against dark, but you get some of it coming out of the darkness into that area.
kind of this looping kind of uh, motion will kind of it creates a little bit of a like a curtain or something like that for the uh, our subject matter too. Like that is that branch coming in from the outside like that creates another layer of depth. I don't know. I mean, I could, might be going overboard with it, but if it's like this bathing little skeleton in the water, maybe it, you know, you kind of create all this kind of cover right here, and it, it kind of gives it its, uh, you know, gives that little skeleton its privacy, you know, having all of this uh, perimeter um, foliage in here, like this. Okay. Sometimes you have to, have to show it a little bit closer so you can see. When you hold it out like this, it kind of starts blending into the background, doesn't it? Okay, there's that. Now, I'm going to have this. There's a skeleton. It's full body, but I'm going to have it like from here up. We'll say that the water is this deep right here, okay? I think from the waist up. Okay, so I got his. Looks like I've inked up a little bit of the pelvis right there, which is fine. I'm going to go a little bit farther down into yeah, those legs, thighs. <clears throat> I'm going to wipe this off though, okay, down here. Now, the reason why is because I want it to kind of transition. Because if this water is somewhat clear, then um, you'll be able to see, you know, some of the bones and things like that underneath the water, but it's just a lighter version of it, okay? Maybe the pelvis bone is a little bit lighter too, okay? All right, so let's go like this. I'm gonna to try to position it in the lightest area. Okay, I can see a little bit down there. See that little shadow? It's very, very subtle, but um, there he is right there. Look at that, taking it. Look at that majestic bath or whatever. It's not even a shower, huh? Okay. Looking here. It's, you know, this... That branch is a little bit too, I've got too much of that branch around here. It's, it's looking a little bit too uh, monotonous in terms of texture. I'm going to use this twisting leaves um, image. I'm using this one a lot these days um, to create that foreground um, variation. Yeah, I think that looks fun like that. See that plant up there? And you get that branch coming out like that, so. leaves on the side there like that. Maybe I'll just leave it at the top like that. I want to have some of that in there. Fun stuff. It's kind of framing it off a little bit more with that uh, those leaves. I might add a little bit more black tone around the perimeter. I'm not sure. We'll see what we get to when we get there. Okay, where's my Dr. Martin's Blade Proof White? It's an opaque white watercolor paint. Very popular with calligraphers for their uh, pen and ink or brushwork on, you know, dark paper, black paper, whatever. But I'm using it as a splatter painting medium, and I'm putting it in a toothbrush 
Sometimes you have to, you know, you have to reconstitute the paint all the time with uh, water if you don't use it. So you just put a little bit of water in there and mix it up. It doesn't have the whole jar doesn't have to be mixed up. I just mix up kind of the top portion of it. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, now I'm going to put it down here in the water. Now I don't hold my stuff to do this. I'm just doing this so you can see it easier on camera. But what I'm doing, okay. So we're not going to just go zip like that. What I do is it's just a watch my thumb here on this brush. It's just a few little bristles at a time. You have to kind of get an idea of where it's splattering to, which direction. It's kind of hard to it um, control it sometime. See that right there? Let's see how close up I can get. See, it's like a couple little bristles at any given time. So I kind of bring it to life, those little splashes like that. And look at it kind of at a, as a hole like that. Just from a textural standpoint. There's some waterfalls over here. It gets really dark, but I think it, it could benefit from a little, little spray like this right here. It just, I don't know, it kind of makes it more festive. And I think I'm going to put some up around this, um, the sky. Who knows what they are? It's like a lens flare. I don't know. Something like that. Or you can just put it as little, I don't know, sprites in the air. Something like that. It's just kind of nice from a textural standpoint, but look at that. It's a little dark, you know, that spray up there. Isn't that kind of fun? It, it just brings a little bit of this illumination and visual interest and texture and contrast to these areas. I mean, who knows what it is? Who cares? It's, uh, <laughs> I, all I know is that sometimes it just looks better in certain areas than not having it. Okay, so here we are from a textural standpoint. Look at that there. Okay. And then certainly a lot down there in that water. Look at that explosive water. It looks really busy and stuff when you look at it close up like that. But again, this is, you know, this is kind of the distance you're going to be viewing something from. This is like arms distance, right? Or card distance, you know, card viewing distance or whatnot. So it's not like, oh my God, there's dots everywhere or something like that. I mean, you can really see it this area down here, but, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not uh, distracting to me. Okay, so let's see. I think I could spray this again now. It's time to spray this again. And then I might add in some little really specific highlighting in here. But um, these impressions right here are a little bit wet. So let's go on spray. Easy enough to do. All right, another spraying. Okay, and one of the things I'm noticing is because I've sprayed this already, you know, a few times, so there's multiple layers of coats of sealant on here. So when I spray it more, I'm not affecting these light beams, okay? They're not getting, you know, more and more transparent the more that I, uh, they're, they're fixed. Okay, now that being said, like I said, if I want to make these lighter, just put another layer right over the top of them, okay? But I think they look okay. Um, as is. Okay, and so what I was talking about was um, I can go in and do some fine-tuning now with some additional um, highlighting work, and I'm going to use my uh, acrylic painter pen. These are, these are really fantastic pens. They're so inexpensive, too. They're sold in um, these multi-packs like this. There's eight. Six white and two black. Okay. I don't know how much I paid for this. It was like $10 or something like that. So 
they're, they're so inexpensive, you can't buy just like one of them. That I saw, at least, on Amazon. And this one's the Meowson one, but I have a feeling that there's multiple brands. And I have a feeling that it's all the same company releasing them under different brand names, or it's just people are buying them from the same factory and just branding them, you know, something different. Because they look the same to me, except the labels are different. Okay, so where do you apply some of this? This is one of those things that has that spring thing, so you just kind of get it flowing and do a little scribble and get it working. Don't do it like a pogo stick, you know, like that, and have a big blob of paint, you know, pour out on you. But let's add some little highlights to some of the tops of these rocks. And this, these paint pens work just fine. They're supposed to work on everything like glass and... Uh, it says, it says on here, glass, paper, um, cloth, metal, plastic. I mean, so it's certainly going to work on top of this sprayed sealed paper. I'm putting some of these highlights on the tops of some of these rocks that are still in an area light enough. Okay, I don't want to put, like, total highlights, some rock that's, you know, in complete darkness because we're saying that there's no... There's no light over there, so you're not going to highlight it greatly. So just on the tops of some of these rocks, I'm putting a little highlight here and there. Where it's really light, I could use a little bit more. There's some rocks in the water. It just seems to make them look, it makes them look a little bit more round and dimensional. I don't know if you can even see it, but see on the tops of some of these rocks like that. Okay, but again, it's, you know, they're not real super obvious, but I think kind of on the whole, when you add little details like this, look at this on top of this rooftop right here. Put a little bit of that paint, but cumulatively, you know, when you do these types of things like this, it kind of all adds up to a much greater hole. Okay, so on these clouds right in here, you know, they're already really light, so this is going to be not, you know, not going to make a great deal of um, difference, but, you know, it makes them a little bit lighter. It's like a white over, I don't know, like a 5% or a 3% gray. And I'm not doing the whole thing, I'm just kind of doing it on the uh, parts closest my light source. Okay. So it's like on the top edge of these clouds, just like it was on the top edge of those rocks. Or, you know, this one's the bottom edge, you know, because that cloud over the top of that's uh, bottom lit. Okay. Um. See this rock down here, putting these little highlights like that. And then, you know, in the greater sense, it looks like that. But it's all those little details like that that can be really fun. And if you have it like a silver pen or something like that, you can, this kind of has this, yeah, it has a warmish tinge to it, doesn't it? But um, here's a silver glitter pen too. Let me see if this is working. Yeah, it's working pretty good. This one's a uh, Uniball Signo silver glitter pen. Yeah, it works, actually it works really good still. I haven't used this one very much, but I'm putting some of this in the water. If you have like stickles or something like that, like a clear, why not put it down here in the water and make it kind of glisten? So let me see if you can see this right here. Uh, see this? Yeah, see this little dots down there? Right here? So someone receives this, they don't see it, but then if they look at it and it captures the light, it's like this little illumination right happening down here, right around your figure. 
it kind of cracks me up you know that there's a skeleton down there but you know in the spirit of the, uh, in the spirit of the season okay let's take some of this and let's put it on a little bit of a cotton swab this one's a q-tip and like I said I, I like the uh, the natural fibers more I've tried kind of the more acrylic styles of a uh, you know cotton swab you know swabs and they just don't they just don't apply very nicely I like this kind of the softer you know type of uh, material and I kind of fray it and loosen it up a little bit like this okay so if you want a soft application of something you have to do it with a soft applicator okay now some of these little um, splattered you know paint splatters with the the Dr. Martens I'm going to illuminate like it's a, like it's a little magical entity like a um, a little spirit or something like that. I forgot they called them in uh, that movie Brave, that Disney movie. See, it's, it's like bringing these little things alive. They're like glowing now, right? See them like glowing right here. They show up more in the darker area, but you, know, you could put it, you know, all around the uh, our subject matter there. I can put some. Maybe they're kind of coming down from the moonlight. I don't know. So on some of these splatters out there, you just kind of, you know, make them glow. So pretty fun, um, kind of Halloween, you know, in spirit scene. I'm not going to make 40 of these ones, not 40 originals, and, you know, I wouldn't do that, but uh, it's just kind of a fun little twist on your, uh, your, your scenic stamping elements, change the color scheme, change the subject matter. I mean, if I, even if I didn't have that skeleton down there, you can do something like this, and, you know, that mill up there would have more of this um, kind of ominous feeling, you know, with those two. One of the things I was going to do is I was going to take a white paint pen and illuminate one of those windows, just make it, like, light. I still could, but I don't think I'm going to... I was going to put, like, a like a Norman, you know, Bates's mom up there in the... Uh, up there in the uh, the window looking out but um, I think it would distract from our subject matter here I think I want all the attention on the on the skeleton down here so I don't think I want to do that I mean it could be you know it could be like someone you know someone looking at it and it would create a little bit of visual dialogue but still I don't, I don't think I want to do that if I did this one again maybe I would but uh, I want to just leave this one as is I'm kind of Putting some little highlights on some of these, uh, this little skeleton too. Highlighting some of the bones and whatnot. Kind of integrates it with the uh, surface a little bit more. I don't think I want to add too much of a shadow down there, though, because it's really kind of airy. Normally, I'd put a little bit of a shadow down here, but I think I like that. Or maybe what I could do is um, around the skeleton instead of adding a shadow. See, I'm gonna put this. Um, a little bit of a splashing, you know, water like this. Little striations in the water too. This horizontal. Just put a few dots. Um, water like this. Gives the water a little bit of a texture. It gives pattern too. Okay, let's see. I'll show you what I was doing down here. So there's little dots going this way, like that. It's quite textured down here. 
Uh, let's take a look here. So it's little glowing little spheres, orbs. That was kind of fun. You see them right over here, right here and here. All right. So I think that's it. I'll give it one more spray, and that'll seal all of that off. And I think that looks, you know, done, finished to me. Um, certainly a fun type of scene. I, I like doing these little whimsical twists on landscape stamps, scenic stamping stamps, and, um, you know, things like Halloween and that uh, holiday season, whatever. Um, kind of gives you a, me a good excuse to uh, do something like that. You know, if we had little bats up here, I think that would be cool up there, too. I don't have a bat design. Um, but uh, you can do something like that. And uh, Or if you had a little witch up here or something like that. But anyways, okay, so this, you know, I mean, it has a really different spirit than this one right over here, right? In terms of time of day, certainly kind of the, you know, the emotions of color and, you know, against a monochromatic. But um, I don't know, you can kind of compare and contrast here. This one's a little bit more, I don't know, well, it's certainly colorful and friendlier and whatnot, but this one I think is more dramatic, right? And, uh, you know, the same foundation in terms of, uh, you know, your basic stamps um, used in it. So just changing around those little elements like that and uh, the color scheme and whatnot. This one's using a different medium, too, you know, in terms of the, uh, the versifying. Do all the coloring on here in addition to the, um, the impressions. So a little bit of different uh, experience for me, so... I don't know. A lot of fun to do. And again, Staples 110 pound paper worked just fine, if not perfect for, you know, what I was using it for. So anyway, it's very accessible and easy to acquire. So anyways, thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, drop me a note in the comment section.